I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about critical minerals and the U.S. national and energy security, we have with us the heads of our energy program, Joseph Mikat and Gracelyn Baskerin. So good to have you here. Great to be here, man. All right. So let me ask you first, Gracelyn, I want to go to you. What's the deal with critical minerals and why are they so important to the United States and to the rest of the world? Critical minerals are what we need for every element of national security, human security, like our electronics and energy security. Without critical minerals, I'm not going to have my missile technology that I need to go to war. I'm not going to have defense systems or night goggles. But I'm also not going to have any nuclear power. I'm not going to have solar or wind power. I'm not going to have computers. I'm not going to have the electronics that keep our economy running. No iPhones. No iPhones. What will we do without iPhones? I know no one wants an Android, but it turns out you need critical minerals for that, too. Both. Both. (laughs) So the reality is, is without critical minerals, our entire economy can come to a stop. And for the U.S., can bring our, like, national security to a stop, too. Okay, so you all recently wrote a report called Prospects for U.S. Minerals and Engagement with Africa. Is the United States falling behind? That's the first question I want to ask you. We used to have all the critical minerals. We had a stockpile of them. And then after the Cold War, what do we do with them? We liquidated them. So where are we now? Can I jump in and say, I actually think it's important to talk about why we talk about certain minerals as critical. Minerals make up all the stuff we want to have. Critical minerals have a somewhat technical definition. It depends on exactly who you ask, where the lines are drawn. But there are minerals where the U.S. tends to be import dependent and where supply disruptions of that mineral would have some profound economic or security impact. And correct me if I'm wrong, we consider certain minerals critical, but Canada may consider other minerals critical that we don't, like copper, for instance. Yeah, Andrew, it's worse than that. Even between different departments in the government, how exactly they classify minerals as critical or not can vary. And it's all about whether you think about the economic or security importance of particular minerals. In general, in the United States, if something is referred to as a critical mineral, that means it's on the list of minerals designated by the United States Geographical Survey as being both highly import dependent and economically important such that supply disruptions would cause problems for economic or national security. So there is a list of approximately 50 minerals. And the reason why people think the U.S. has lost a step is for like 25 of those, half of them, we're mostly dependent on China for the supply of the minerals that we need to power our modern lives or drive an energy transition or any of those things. Just for those of us who don't know a lot about this, Gracelyn, can you tell me what do we classify as critical minerals, particularly the 25 or so that Joseph was just talking about? So if we were to rank the top ones that the United States is pursuing quite intentionally, rare earths would be the biggest one. And part of that is because China has control. They produce about 60 percent, but they have over 90 percent of processing capacity. Rare earths are one of those things that brings us to a dead halt. The other ones we need are cobalt. And the U.S. actually doesn't have a large share of cobalt. We actually import the majority of our cobalt from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Gallium, which we know has been recently impacted by Chinese critical mineral restrictions. Graphite, which the U.S. is actually starting to cultivate from various countries, acknowledging that we don't have enough of it. And it's one of our five critical minerals that go into our electric vehicle batteries. There's a list of rare earths on that list, which have very long names, and I'm not going to do them justice. <laughs> okay. My my dad is a geologist. He frowns on my pronunciation of some of these words. Lithium, we talk about all day. Nickel, platinum. So a lot of these are part of EV batteries. Some of them are substitutable. Some are not. Manganese, no known substitute. You can do very little without it. And the reason we're talking about this now is because of our national security, but also because of the energy transitions that we're going through. So this report you have, why the United States needs to engage with Africa, let's go to that. Why should the U.S. partner with African countries on critical minerals? Because Africa has a lot of critical minerals. So if we think about it, okay, we just talked about manganese, right? It's not substitutable. Everybody needs it. Africa has over 80% of the world's manganese. And about 15% of that is actually in Gabon, which just had a coup. So this isn't rocket science. We go where the We the go minerals where the are. minerals are. <laughs> right, right. Okay. You know, platinum. It, it is geology. Yeah. Okay. 
I always say it's not manufacturing. You can't pick up your t-shirt plant and move it. You got to go where it's underground. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. I got you. So it's important for us to partner with Africa, African countries, because they have what we need. 100%. I mean, they have almost everything that we need to make an electric vehicle battery and in large quantities. Okay. So, but the better question really is, is why hasn't the U.S. solidified strong mineral partnerships with African countries to that end? So I think there's a couple of reasons. So first of all, the U.S.'s engagement with Africa has historically been aid. It's not been a bad thing. It's done important things. I mean, Bush's PEPFAR program saved 25 million people from AIDS, right? But at the same time, we've engaged it in aid. And then we had a trade preference program that Bill Clinton put into effect in 2000. It's due for extension in two years. But it's a unilateral preference program, right? So African goods that are produced enter the U.S. tariff-free, 6,500 goods, right? But the challenge is it's not bilaterally beneficial. And the majority of goods that have come in are like T-shirts, right? They're low value added. So I think for the first time, I think bipartisan, we're going, how do we engage with the continent with critical minerals in a way that's mutually beneficial? Because African countries are like, I don't want to export my raw resources so you gain all the benefits. So bipartisan is good, no question about it, in an era where we have very little of it. So how does the United States use that bipartisan mandate to strengthen partnerships with Africa? And why does China currently have a stronger partnership on critical minerals with African countries. Because China's been there for a very long time. China's probably got a 40-year ahead start on us. So while we've been helping Africa with aid, China's been doing business there. Absolutely. They're very commercially oriented. You will find the U.S. has historically taken a very strong human rights democracy stance. China hasn't. China's like, how do I build my economy in a beneficial way? And that's given them that decades long advantage. So the communists are the ultimate capitalists in this case. Well, they have a long term strategic view that I think there's a fair criticism that we lost a step and we need to regain it here in the U.S. and broadly throughout the West. So state backed enterprises are pretty risk tolerant. They're willing to work in environments where Western firms might have trouble because of corruption issues, human rights issues. And over the past couple of decades has allowed China to really get a lead on building out mineral supply chains, not just for electronics, but especially those things we need for energy transition because they perceive a large growing future market. And one of the things that has also happened is because China is sort of the manufacturing hub of the world, the off takers are in China too. So there's a lot of vertical integration that's going on. Now, as the U.S. and other countries in the West are saying, we want to be part of this clean energy transition, we don't want to be solely dependent on China, we want to be able to manufacture solar panels or batteries or motors here or with amongst our friends, we're now looking to develop a supply chain that will let us do that. So, Joe, is China a threat to the critical minerals supply chain? I would say China poses a challenge on two parts. One, it's a stiff competitor. And two, because of the degree of market dominance that Chinese firms have, American consumers and the businesses that are trying to be set up to supply them are subject to Chinese manipulations of markets or just to public policy. So that can have changes in Chinese public policy with respect to EV batteries can have dramatic effects on the economics of projects not just here in the United States, but projects that people are trying to develop around the world. We do think there's a strong policy case for the U.S. and its allies to try and prevent the worst manipulation, but just improve market conditions so that we can get enough finance into developing our own supply chains. Okay, so we need to do better in our trade relationships with African countries. How do we start when it comes to minerals? So first, I think we need to remember why we want to do it. And the biggest thing is, for example, the DRC exported $4.4 billion of cobalt last year. 100% of it went to China. Then China keeps some of it and they export some of it. So they essentially function as an intermediary such that if they want to impose export restrictions, which they've had a ninefold increase in the last decade on critical minerals, we are now at risk, right? So the question is, how do we do that? And I think there's two big areas that we need to work on. The first is we need to invest across the value chain. Remember that in 2050, one out of every four people in the world are going to live in Africa. So they have a desperate need for jobs to build 
economic growth. So I needed to come to you and say, hey, if mining is not labor intensive, but processing, manufacturing, these are. But these countries don't have the capital markets that they can finance this on their own. And the U.S. does. So I need to build that value chain, investment, job generation. That's what these governments are looking for, number one. And two, it's saying there's a big incentive to bring these countries, producer countries, and build trade agreements that let them benefit from the Inflation Reduction Act. Because by 2027, what 80% of mineral inputs for your batteries have to be sourced from either the U.S. or countries it has a free trade agreement with. So right now, if I'm a U.S. firm, I have very little incentive to go invest into African countries because the metals that I source will not be eligible for the IRA benefit. So it's an easier way to incentivize the investments across the value chain, generate mutual benefits. Okay, so along those lines, how would the expansion of the Inflation Reduction Act advance the trade relationship between the U.S. and Africa? It creates opportunity. So the way that that tax credit works is if you can buy the battery or source the battery materials from a country that we have a trade agreement with, or specifically a free trade agreement, then a firm can say, hey, we can develop this supply chain, we can make the necessary investments, and we know that there's going to be a certain degree of subsidy of that supply chain, right? That's what the IRA in many parts was designed to do. It's not just about getting EVs on the road. It's about building a supply chain that's going to meet U.S. demand and in particular will allow us to compete with China, which has a fair lead on a lot of these technologies. It creates commercial opportunity when you can have a trade agreement that allows for those benefits to be spread across borders. Graceland, most Americans know the term blood diamonds as it refers to Africa. Should we be worried about potential human rights issues arising from mining issues related to critical minerals in Africa as well? Absolutely. Mining has inherently been an exploitative industry from the days of King Leopold many centuries ago, right? So one of the questions I think from the both the government, but also what most private companies want to know is how do I avoid that? It is a huge reputational risk and we've seen that play out. What we don't have yet is a uniform set of standards on human rights that companies and the government can utilize to say, am I meeting a set of requirements that I need to make that investment? Especially, I think the Biden administration is particularly interested in human rights. But it really takes away the risk for investors of upsetting their local communities. And we know, we see over and over that human rights will drive companies out. It upsets governments. But importantly, you know, we've talked a little bit about this upstairs. If the U.S. has a strong set of human rights, it gives us a competitive advantage when making a bid for mining and processing to the producer countries compared to other countries that don't have that standard. So we should view it as a competitive advantage that we can offer if we get it right. Okay, so do you believe there's going to be a plan to ensure that human rights are not encroached upon? I believe that's the way that we have to go in able to make it mutually beneficial and de-risk it for the private sector. Speaking of the private sector, you can't have a discussion these days without talking about AI, artificial intelligence. How is AI being used to advance the mining industry? So two years ago now, the United States signed a memorandum of understanding with Zambia and the Democratic Republic of Congo to strengthen you know, electric vehicle battery supply chains. Now, mining exploration is incredibly expensive, and it has a success rate. Sometimes it's lower than 10%. There's a company, it's a California-based company, and what they do is they use artificial intelligence to go in, kind of scan to see what's there, ore grades, what areas are worth extracting from, targeting those areas, and then using that data to identify where they can scale up. And it reduces exploration costs, it reduces the risk associated with it, and the idea is it can also accelerate mine development. If I go in and kind of manually explore, exploration can take three, four years. And then I've got to build my mine and then I've got to start producing. That's a long time. So the idea is AI enables it to be cheaper, but it also makes it quicker. And so cobalt is actually expected to end up putting together one of the world's biggest and most productive copper mines using this technology. And like you said, mining's dangerous. And so AI could eliminate some of the potential human risk. Is that right? Absolutely. Anytime you go in with the size of the machinery that you do in a mine, you have a risk. So it makes it safer. And that safety record is really important to investors. I want to ask both of you this question, but I want to go first to Graceland. How do you think U.S. partnerships with African countries on mining of critical minerals, how will it impact the lives of people all around the globe? 
So I'm going to start by saying, how is it going to benefit Africa? Africa has 590 million people without access to energy. If you think about what number that means, that's one and a half times the entire size of the U.S. population. Africa's only gotten 2.5% of renewable energy investment over the last 20 years. So what I also want to do is I want to start to manufacture this renewable energy technology and start to move towards what we should be heading for, which is sustainable development goal number seven, universal energy access. And we're very far away from that. So that's a key benefit I see is saying, let's get everybody power, but also, you know, you have resources. Let's make them domestically beneficial. Number one, I think two is, again, we've talked a little bit about the benefits for host countries, jobs jobs, revenue. A lot of these countries are in a debt crisis. Zambia became the first country to default during the COVID-19 pandemic. And they're hoping, President finger crossed, that they triple their copper production in the next you know, seven years to be able to find their way out of debt. So that's, I think, a third benefit. And I think globally, I think everyone benefits from diversified sourcing of critical minerals. You know, it doesn't matter. Who, the U.S. should never have 100 percent of the sources. China shouldn't. Russia shouldn't. Australia shouldn't. To the extent that we diversify, diversify. We create security for everyone. And that's the world order. I don't think it's like U.S. versus China. It's really just saying, how do we create that diversified base so that we reduce the risk of disruption to anyone? I mean, I completely agree with Graceland. When you think about what is the U.S.'s role at this moment in time, we have an ongoing energy transition. We're doing that because we're responding to climate change. One of the things that is increasingly on our radar, our policymakers' radar, is it's going to take a lot of minerals, and we need to be able to develop those efficiently, cleanly, humanely. And the U.S. has a huge opportunity to provide a counterbalance and to China and just additional effort on that drive. And if our goal becomes not just how does the U.S. secure its own minerals, that's absolutely important. We should do that. That's important for national and economic security. But in terms of providing a global public good, the U.S. contributing fulsomely to larger, more diverse supply chains for these minerals will improve the world's ability to meet the climate challenge, to transition to a zero carbon energy system faster and more securely, and that's gonna redoubt to the benefit of all. Well, I wanna thank you both. I mean, we are all hearing a lot more about critical mineralists these days, and you both really just put this in a lot of perspective. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank Andrew. Thank you for having us. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts. From Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 